Okay, cool. Awesome. All right, nice to meet you guys. Um, my name is uh, Mark Rosenberg. I am a neurology resident at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, um, in the US. Um, I obviously being neurology, I'm all about the brain, but in particular, the thing that I really care about is how the brain does in space, or I guess how it doesn't do so well in space. Um, and one of the particular interests that we've had over here is how the cerebrovascular system ties into different neuro, uh, neurologic symptoms or neurologic syndromes. Um, the biggest one right now that's kind of in the spotlight is this thing called SANS. And the purpose of this presentation is one, to familiarize you guys with SANS, what it is, um, but it's also to talk about the research that we're doing here and some of the kind of breakthrough insight that we've determined thus far. If you guys have any questions, please put it in the chat. Um, because I am a Labrador, I'll probably get distracted by it and I might stop the presentation halfway through or I might wait until the end. Cole, how have you guys been doing it? Um, yeah, whatever um, you're, you're open to and, and would be the most coherent. Uh, you know, we can ask questions um, verbally or, or, or in the chat. Kind of, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah which, whichever, I mean, whichever you guys want. Um, or, if, you know, if it's super pressing, you can always just kind of chime in and, and then you can stop me if I don't see it. Um, but anyways, so, you know, the, the presentation is called All About Sands. And then the more technical, especially the name of the paper, um, it's pre and post flight dural vein enlargement, and it's associated with space flight associated neuroocular syndrome. Okay, perfect. So I want to thank you know a couple of my mentors, uh, Donna Roberts, who's a Titan in her own right. She's been working with NASA um, in some way or another for the past thirty years. Samuel Kassab, he's a neurovascular surgeon, um, and a couple of other neurosurgery and um, you know, neurologic colleagues of mine. Our research was funded by NASA. Forgive the uh, font. It's in line with Comic Sans. Yeah, Sans. I know it's really cheesy, but there you go. That's why That's why I choose Comic Sans. It's only for this terrible joke. So there you go. And uh, so uh, my first question I want to ask you guys is, what does space medicine, a U.S. senator, and Oscar-winning actress all have in common? For those of you that don't know, it's the topic of this conversation. So SANS is, believe it or not, something that ties all these people um, together. And I will show you why. So uh, for those of you that are living in the United States, this is okay. For those of you that are living outside the United States, please don't get me in trouble with the uh, movie people um, because I will be streaming something off of Netflix. So if you haven't had the opportunity to watch the show away, I highly recommend it. Is unfortunately canceled after one season, but it's a it's a pretty good show with Hillary Swank. So that acts that answers the uh, Oscar winning actress segment. Um, but there's a portion of the show where they have this grizzled Russian cosmonaut. He's kind of the veteran of the crew. He's gone to space multiple times, and he starts having visual problems. Now it actually acts as a as a plot point of, of struggle amongst the crew because he's kind of keeping it secret. Um, and so this is just a quick clip from the show. I don't know if the audio will come through. Hopefully it does, um, so you can see it. We should take a short break. I don't need a break. All I need is to be left alone to do my job. Misha. What? Back away from the panel. Emma, I already You can't told... see a thing. What? The screw just flew right by you. Oh, oh, that's... That's a catastrophe. I have How many fingers? I, what? Am I holding? How many fingers? I'll go to hell. Answer the question. It can't be seen. Answer the question, Misha. So, um, as you can tell, it's clearly a very dramatic point, and nothing like this has happened thus far. But there's not a lot that's stopping people from this happening, too. Now, you can already see he has these really thick glasses, which that's definitely rooted in reality. Every astronaut that gets sent up to space that's going to be there for a period of time gets sent up with something called space anticipation glasses, which is literally expecting people's vision to get worse. And it's because of this phenomenon called SANS, which I'll discuss um, now. Yeah, terrible fonts of hand SANS. So what is SANS? SANS, previously called VIP, um, 
which was visual impairment and increased intracranial pressure, um, changed its name a couple of years ago to space flight associated neuroocular syndrome. VIP was kind of a misnomer because while we did know there was visual impairment, we didn't truly know if there was increased intracranial pressure. But with SANS, this is a much more nondescript, but a little bit more inclusive of a term. It's a constellation of symptoms that's been reported in 40 to 60% of NASA astronauts. And, it, and some of these symptoms are pretty cardinal. And that includes globe flattening. So the actual orbit will get deformed over time. You can get optic disc edema, so swelling in the back. You, of course, will get changes. Oh, can you guys hear, hear me? Yes. Okay, there we go. Um, you'll get changes in visual acuity, of course, because as the globe changes, the actual vision, the fixed point of, of vision will change. You know, of course, get retinal injury. And this is all oftentimes because of vascular changes in the back of the eye. And then you can get actual folds in the tissue in the back of the eye called these coronal retinal folds. And it's because you have um, changes in the vascularity as well as some localized edema that will over time cause fibrosis and change and just long-term changes. And some of these, particularly the corneal retinal folds, they can be seen years after the fact in some of these astronauts that have been there for a period of time. So going back to what I had asked before about the U.S. Senator and the, ass and the, uh, and the actress, so of course we know about the Kelly brothers, so they, they involved, you know, they were involved in the twin study, they're kind of the quintessential astronaut, rough and tumble kids, um, and uh, Mark Kelly played the, the role on Earth while Scott Kelly was up in space for more or less just short of a year, and Scott Kelly was a very adamant supporter of this condition. And even up to this day, he still uses glasses of a significant, significantly different diopter than what he's than what he had before going to flight. And this is years after. I think he came back in 2017. And so five years later, he still has vision changes from this condition. So as you can see here, this is the globe flattening. So on the left is pre-flight, on the left is post-flight. And you can see the back of the eye just smushed and because it's gets getting smushed and kind of pinwheel cameras when you change the fixed point of where the image is it's going to appear blurry and so this is what's happening is because you're getting a change in the back of the eye for a number of reasons that i'll get to in a little bit you will see changes in the actual vision itself then next up we have optic disc edema okay so we have od is the is the right and OS uh, sinister. I know it's kind of a bad name, but that's the Latin term for left. Um, so OD on the right and OD and uh, so uh, right is going to be on our left and left is going to be on the right. But the top is pre-flight and the bottom is post-flight. So you can see um, right where that where that bright area is. It looks pretty contiguous throughout, but if you look bottom, it looks a lot more boggy. Right? It looks a little bit more. A little bit more gray a little bit darker and then you actually see where those arrows are pointing that's actually getting a little bit oh, the vascularity changing that we see in um, in sands and it's this it's this retinal injury and you can see what they call like flame hemorrhages and so you can actually see vascular changes Let's see there's a question yeah um, anyway so so the change of the visual acuity, like I was saying, when you have the focal point actually getting adjusted because the globe is getting flattened, that's going to change the, the focal point of the image that you're looking at. Now, of course, that's going to be problematic because now people are going to get worse in division. And the problem is, is that we know that there's a dose dependency component to it. These symptoms can be seen as early as two weeks in astronauts, but especially looking at the Kelly brothers, the longer you're in space, there's the possibility that more fibrosis that uh, more fibrosis could occur, or at least the return to normalcy or pre-flight standards could potentially get worse and worse. And this also begs the question of, you know, this is on Earth. How is that going to change when you go to one sixth gravity on the moon or one third gravity on Mars? Are we expecting that that you know it's going to take 150 or uh, I guess uh, you know, 66% longer, or is it going to take, you know, three times as long for your vision to get better back on, on, on Mars and what on Earth? These are a lot of questions that people have. But to get back to, to this point right here, it's this change in the back of the eye that's really caused 
causing at least the most notable symptom, which is going to be the change in the actual visual acuity. So as I was mentioning before, we can see some retinal in, uh, injuries, and that's because the vascularity changes and you have these really discrete tiny vessels in the back of the eye that sometimes they don't tolerate fluid shifts as well as other parts of the brain and other parts of the body, and so can cause injury to the, to the vessels themselves. So what we were looking at right here, this is called an OCT or optical coherence tomography. It's a new imaging modality that's being used pretty widely on the ISS to assess for basically thickness at the back of the eye. The best way to think about it is that it looks like one of those old JVC kind of over the shoulder uh, video cameras, but instead of looking at the eyepiece, you're looking at the camera itself. And so what it does is it shoots pictures and based off of um, X-ray and based off of the, the uh, the algorithm that they use are able to kind of discern these images at the back of the eye. And so you can see that, particularly at the bottom image, we're seeing more of those folds that can that can permeate a little bit more and hit multiple layers. And that's this chorioretinal folding. Now, going back to the, the point that I was making here, you can see these folds even on a really small level if the focal point's changing just by you know, micrometers or, or millimeters of, of change is enough to cause symptoms in these, in these individuals. All right, so causes, you know, everybody says, oh, well, you know, intuitively, it must be because in microgravity, you get a caudal fluid shift, right? You know, you don't have the legs that's pulling, you don't have the blood that's pulling your legs, so it must be going to your brain, and it must be going to the back of the eye. That's one of the most widely accepted, but we're also finding out that it's not that easy. It's not that simple. We're also seeing that there's other potential um, changes. Yeah, for, of course, there's the theorized increased intracranial pressure. That's kind of the big one. And that was the thought before when they had it named as VIP, but of course, it's no longer called VIP. And that's because we know that there's other things that are happening. There's also translaminar pressure gradients. So we're seeing that there's different pressures based off of intrathoracic pressure, intracranial pressure, and it's this uh, this basically the struggle with pressures that, that could be potentially playing a role in the back of the eye. We're of course seeing intracerebral shifts in volume, and this isn't just interver uh, intravascularly or, ex or extravascularly. You know, we would think that, yes, of course, blood is going to go to your brain, but blood stays in blood vessels, right? Versus with sands, which is where this fluid is coming out, it's coming from somewhere else. So we know that there's other fluid shifts than just blood itself. There's also uh, been some data that's demonstrated that vitamin deficiencies or um, vitamin management has also been associated with changes in sand. So cyanocobalamin or B, vitamin B12 and folate, folate, which is vitamin B9, we've seen that disruptions in those pathways can lead to increased development of sands as well. We can also see volume expansion or the fluid just getting bigger in the vessels of the choroid. So like I was saying before, in those thin little layers at the back of the eye, we can see some things. Hypercapnia or increased CO2 um, is something that's that has been theorized as well. When you have too much carbon dioxide, that promotes the blood vessels in your brain to open up, which would encourage more blood flow getting to your brain, which could theoretically cause more of that blood to the fluid in the blood to kind of move out and cause compression of localized areas, which one of the, eye, the eyes could be one of those. Another really, really interesting phenomenon that we see in space that a lot of people don't think about is gas does not behave normally in space like it does on Earth. When you breathe in and out in the room that you're in, the carbon dioxide is filling the space. But in microgravity, what it actually does is it causes a bubble um, in front of your face. So astronauts are just at baseline, a little bit hypercapnic, or they have a little bit of increased carbon dioxide because the, they're just not dispelling the carbon dioxide as easily as you and I would on Earth. We know that the ventricles, which is kind of like the fluid sponge of the brain, um, that changes as well. It's, it's a part of the brain that's responsible for providing a nutrient wash, almost like pickle juice in a pickle, in a pickle jar, if your brain's the pickle. Um, we see changes in how that fluid is coming in and out or getting absorbed. And then, of course, you know, the, like I was saying before with the blood, you know, that's at a, in a compartment within the blood vessels. But you can get fluid that shifts other places, different compartments of the brain. And the problem is that your head is solid, and so there's only so much pressure that can be exerted within a solid space. Right? And then, of course, potential other risk factors, space, right? The biggest risk factor for developing this condition is being in space. So that's obviously the biggest risk factor. 
And then more space. The more time you're in space, the higher the risk factor increases. But there's also thoughts that ionizing radiation could be a contributing factor. We saw, particularly with the uh, with the Apollo astronauts, their their risk of developing cardiovascular disease increased threefold compared to controls. Um, and a large part of it was thought ionizing radiation, particularly we've seen with map uh, with mouse models. Ionizing radiation has has caused this weird stuff to happen to the cerebrovascular system. And ultimately, we're looking at what could be a cerebrovascular condition. Sex is also another one. This is a condition that we've seen almost exclusively in men. We aren't sure why yet. The thought is, to get to the next point, body mass. And so um, we've seen with men, not even necessarily obesity, but just guys that are bigger, either more muscle mass or bone mass, that they have also an increased risk for developing SANS. Another uh, interesting thought is this question of more intense exercise. So SANS is a condition that has been largely observed in NASA and ESA astronauts. There is a possible degree of either under reporting or under recording from the from cosmonauts. But we also know that the exercise regimen that the ESA and the NASA astronauts follow is different than the ones that the Russians do. Ours is much more load dependent. So we have, the, for example, the Ares device, which is a independent weightlifting resistance um, device that exists in the ISS. And so it consists of a lot of squatting, um, deadlifts, you know, bench press, a lot of, um, you know, pushing intense strain exercises versus the Russian cosmonauts, they use a lot of cardio. So they have like exercise bikes and everything. And so we've seen that the, the people that do this more weightlifting kind of exercise has an increased risk for, for the SANS condition. There's also this higher salt burden. Um, you know, when you have more salt, you retain fluid more easily. And so higher risk that that fluid could go somewhere else. And then nutritional changes, kind of tying into the vitamins that we were discussing, but we know that also with nutrition, salt uh, varies. And then the last risk factor is the CO2 air bubble is actually potentially causing um, you know, problems more indirectly as far as um, it, the gas escaping in certain, certain parts of the body. Okay. Okay. So management, so like I said before, every astronaut gets sent up with these things called space anticipation glasses. They, they just know, and, and it's not just one pair, it's not just two pairs, they can get three or four or five, um, just depending on how long they're gonna be up there. I know this is something that the, the idea has been thrown around a lot, um, the idea of a Chivas suit. So a Chivas suit has been around for a while now with the Russians, um, but it was recently kind of fleshed out a little bit more with Dan Levin's group, um, in Texas, where it's a negative pressure suit that people wear. Uh, Dan Levin kind of turned the typical regimen on its head where he wanted people to use it at night. And that has shown some promise with head down models. Now, of course, that's terrestrial models. So until we actually do it in vivo, we won't have full understanding of, of the effects that it has with true SANS. Um, but as I said, it's demonstrated a little bit of promise with our terrestrial head down models. We see changes, there were, there's changes to ISS CO2. So Scott Kelly in his book, he complains a lot about how he could tell when there were more people on the International Space Station because he would feel more cranky, he would feel more fatigued. He'd basically be complaining of the symptoms of being hypercapnic, of having too much CO2. Um, so much so that his fiance at the time, Amico, was actually complaining that she knew when there were more people on the International Space Station. And so the uh, NASA folks did a lot of research, and the research was fairly equivocal as far as if having um, increased CO2 caused a lot of symptoms. But from a complaint standpoint from the astronauts, they decided to add an extra scrubber, a CO2 scrubber. So previously they had two, but then they, had, they added another one to try and reduce this even more. So changes to the ISS CO2 might potentially play a role. And the thought is maybe changing the exercise regimen, you know, if maybe the Russians are having some kind of success with doing more cardio based, maybe that's something worth um, evaluating. And then the last thing is medications. So there are a couple of medications that we use for terrestrial models of this condition of SANS. Um, there's one similar to it called idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which is a, a condition that we typically see with obese females on earth, young obese females on earth. And there are some medications that we use for that. Um, the downside to these medications is one of the big side effects that we can see from it 
is kidney stone formation. And so that's obviously a huge problem, right? If we know that kidney stones is one of the like biggest X nay, you're not going to be an astronaut, um, then giving them a medication that could potentially encourage and promote the formation of kidney stones is a huge, huge urologic emergency. And so that obviously increases risk stratification. And, uh, you know, it's definitely something, well, do we trade off and decrease the risk of SANS theoretically on a medication, or do we know that we could increase the risk of developing kidney stones? So now we'll get to the actual study. Um, you know, the, the, it was published in, um, in the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, um, back in October. Yeah, in October. Um, and basically what we were doing is we were looking at the veins within the skull to see if that was potentially associated with this condition, okay? And so our primary endpoint was this. We wanted to see if astronauts were having abnormal changes to their venous system, all right? That was the first endpoint. The second endpoint was we wanted to see if the people that did have changes also had the symptoms or signs of SANS. Now, all the astronauts, they get a, a pretty robust um, workup before and afterwards. So these aren't things that we had to do additionally. We just had to kind of go through the information. So we conducted retrospective quantitative and qualitative assessments of venograms, um, which is basically an imaging sequence that allows for the veins to pop up. So again, it was a retrospective, quantitative, and qualitative assessment on pre- and post-flight venograms. So they got this imaging before and after flight. Then what we did was we took the um, astronauts who developed signs and symptoms of SANS, and we divided it into the people that did and the people that didn't. We also, uh, we were able to get the MRI data from the NASA Lifetime Surveillance of Astronaut Health Program, which is a really robust health documentation program that they do before and after for the rest of the life of astronauts. The MRIs were performed around 530 days before spaceflight and shortly after return with a standard deviation of 187 uh, days before and 1.5 days afterwards. So as you see here on the left, that was our um, qualitative assessment and on the right was a quantitative assessment. So the qualitative was this. We basically took a bunch of neuroradiologists, we blinded them to the imaging um, and we said, hey, is this part of the brain bigger, smaller, or the same? And we did that several times. So they either said it's bigger, smaller, or it's the same um, to all the astronauts that we had. And I think it was about uh, 12 or 13 astronauts. On the right was a little bit more involved. So on the right, what we did was we got all the images and we made them the same. So we made them look the same as far as clarity. We made them look the same as far as the actual uh, like darkness of it in order to pump it through um, uh, an artificial intelligence software, okay? So we took the images, we accentuated the vessels, the structures in question. We basically said, this is where this structure ends, this is where this structure begins, yada, yada. And then we ran it through this computer algorithm that was basically able to look at the diameter of these blood vessels. And from there, determine if there was an increase in the volume that they were holding just based off of if they got more engorged or not. So the results, um, we did a couple of different things. So the differences in the pre to post flight percentage change in the quantitative assessment was evaluated via Mann Whitney U tests, um, and we looked at medians. And then the uh, the qualitative was point by serial correlation. So we were, we were basically looking. At, you know, it's, it's a good way to stratify when you have two points. So it's either yes or no. Um, again, so we had four astronauts that had symptoms of SANS, eight astronauts that didn't. The mean age um, was around 51 for the astronauts that had SANS versus 46 for the ones that didn't. One female and three males for SANS versus one female and seven that didn't. And then the mean duration of imaging beforehand, or um, that they were in space rather, was 241 days um, for those that did and 156 days for the ones that didn't develop SAMS. So, um, as you can see here, the SAMS astronauts had a significantly greater change than the ones that didn't. Um, so the superior sagittal sinus, which is this big vein that runs up the top and the middle in between the two big hemispheres of the brain, um, it had a change of about 
compared to the ones that didn't. The ones that didn't actually had a, a shrinking of theirs. So their diameter got a little bit smaller, about 3% or 2.66%. Um, the right transverse sigmoid sinus, which is a sinus that runs along kind of the back from like the, that big point in the back, of your, the back of your head, almost to the point that's behind your ear, um, and that runs laterally, that had the biggest change. That had a change of 17% in the people that had developed SANS compared to the ones that didn't had about a 0.7% increase in size. On the left, it wasn't as dramatic, but it was still kind of within the same ballpark. And so they had a 9% increase on the left side versus the ones that didn't develop SANS had a decrease of their size of about 1.4%. And you can see here on the, on the graph on the right, that just kind of demonstrates it more dramatically, um, especially the, the right, transverse sinus and sigmoid sinus had a much more dramatic change compared to everywhere else in the brain. So the uh, the images, you know, I know we're not all neuro neuroradiologists here, but I chose the most dramatic images to kind of demonstrate um, just how much of a change there was. So the top row is someone that developed SANS, the bottom row is someone that did it. If you look right in the middle, you're going to see it's a lot fatter. It's a lot more engorged. All the vessels just look bigger. Compared to on the bottom, it's it looks pretty much the same. It actually maybe a little bit smaller from C to D, but from A to B, you can tell that that middle vein in particular just got a lot bigger. And this is for a common, you know, lay person that hasn't spent hundreds of thousands of hours looking at brain images. So for the neuroradiologists, you know, some of these were just uh, were slammed on for them. So discussion, um, you know, the leading hypothesis for developing the SANS is a loss of gravitational hydrostatic pressure. So it's again, it's that loss of the, of the blood flow, seen in microgravity that leads to blood flow moving from the legs to the brain. And so what you ultimately get is you get a venous congestion. So we know that blood gets into places arterially, it's that red blood, and then it gets a little bit darker and becomes veins. And so we know that veins don't move as well in space. Um, there was an astronaut that in 2017, they were doing ultrasound studies of their internal jugular vein, which is a big vein in your neck. They're doing ultrasound studies, and they found that one of them had a complete occlusion, a complete blockage of one of their veins. It was This was an emergency, um, had never been witnessed before. So the flight surgeons down at NASA had to meet with a bunch of vascular, vascular folks and determine, okay, what's the best thing we can do? Because we know that as soon as she lands or he lands on Earth, that clot is going to cause problems. Um, at that time, the person was asymptomatic, but it, obviously the, the risk potential is super high. So they had to fly up a rocket with a blood thinner on it um, and, uh, and treat it. And then, of course, they had to reverse it to a heparin. Um, before before they landed, because then, of course, you can't have someone that's anticoagulated or has a propensity to bleed while they land on Earth, because that could obviously lead to a lot of problems. Um, there's a potential venous congestion that acts locally at the level of the eye. So behind the eye, specifically, there might be that just that, that engorgement um, that could, off, um, of course, lead to optic disc edema. So what can happen is, just like when you get a mosquito bite, that fluid starts to move out of the veins, the area of inflammation, same thing can happen with this optic disc edema. So you get inflammation, the fluid can move from the veins to the, um, to the surrounding tissue. But the problem is, is that blood that moves slower has a higher likelihood of that happening just passively. So obviously you want blood that's moving all the time. So if you get blood that pools, then that's gonna happen. I don't know how many of y'all had gone on long flights or have been sitting for a long period of time, your legs feel more swollen. And that's why, because when you're sitting, the blood kind of pools in your legs. And so that blood will, the, the fluid, the, the water in the, in the blood will actually start to kind of just passively diffuse out. And so that can be a problem if you have really discrete structures in a really enclosed space. And so we can see that at the level of the optic nerve. The interesting thing is, in our NASA astronauts, instead of narrowing of the Drovina sciences, like you would expect if fluid is moving out, we're actually seeing enlargement, which is pretty interesting. Um, that would be more suggestive of maybe an engorgement of the vessels themselves from the inside. This is, like I said, similar to a terrestrial analog of something called idiopathic intracranial hypertension. It is a little bit different though, because of course these people are fit and they're astronauts. They're not um, necessarily the same as we would see with uh, these people that have IIH. So 
a couple of other things. I know it's a little bit technical, but um, I think it helps with the picture. So the veins, most veins that we think of are pretty loosey goosey. They're pretty floppy. Um, but the veins in our skull are actually not. So we have a lot of really thick connective tissue layers that's meant to keep our brains pretty fixed. Because otherwise, if the brain is just moving around a hard structure, the brain itself is pretty soft. And so it can lead to injury um, and it can lead to problems for the brain itself. And so the brain has a lot of connective tissue. Um, and these veins, they run through these really thick layers. So it's a little bit interesting that you would see engorgement of these veins when they're stuck between these thick layers. And so what's actually more concerning is maybe we're seeing a problem with the connective tissue layer itself, where it allows for more give than one should anticipate. Um, so there's a question. Great question. I will I will get to that um, shortly. I can talk about that in a second. Um, but uh, we see that you know that you would not expect for veins to engorge when they're sandwiched between these really thick layers. And so maybe the the thick layers aren't as thick as they should be. Um, and so that's you know that one of that one of the theories because that's one of the few ways that we can explain why we're seeing these changes of the veins. And so it, it might be this laxity, okay? It's what we call compliance is, is the wall's ability to give. Um, and so we might be seeing problems with the compliance in these people that develop idiopathic endocrine hypertension, but we also might be seeing this compliance problem in the astronauts. And it might not have ever been a problem for them unless they're put into the circumstance where they could have changes in the blood flow that could result in this in this um, congestion or this engorgement. So this is a picture again, just to describe a little bit what I was saying. So what we're seeing right here, this SSS, that's the superior sagittal sinus, okay? And as you can see, it's got a whole bunch of stuff around it. You have a bunch of connective tissue and the inner dura and the outer dura, but then you have the skull right on top of it. So there's a lot of thick stuff that should not be letting these superior sagittal sinuses enlarge, but yet they do. So how do we explain that if it's not necessarily a problem with the superior sagittal sinus, which the current convention is offering that? Maybe it's something that's problematic in regards to the actual dura itself. Okay. So um, distension of the walls of the dural venous sinuses may reflect venous sinus laxity, especially those that develop SANS. Um, and it might be the laxity, it might be you know, genetic or who knows why it's happening, um, but it might be that laxity that encourages or promotes the development of SANS um, because, again, dural venous sinuses are pretty rigid. And so people that might have problems with that rigidity might develop SANS. That rigidity should resist the development of this in increased intracranial venous congestion, um, but the people who develop SANS might have problems with that. Alternatively, um, you know, enlargement of the dural sinuses in astronauts with SANS does happen after return to Earth. So we might be seeing a confounding effect where, you know, because we can't do imaging in space as of yet, we're seeing people that have returned back to Earth. So that's something to keep in mind. You know, the imaging was done back on Earth. So what, you know, what could have happened is maybe they had some kind of change, but then them being back in gravity, we're seeing a phenomenon of engorgement. There is something called a waterfall effect that happens at the level of the bridging gain veins, which are these small, small veins. Basically what happens is when you suddenly get a change in pressure, it almost causes like a negative pressure and you get a waterfall. So stuff that was there before suddenly drains and now you have a whole rush of new fluid that could potentially cause engorgement. So that's another thing that, you know, just requires further study. Ultimately, the only way we're really going to fully determine what's happening is by actually getting MRIs in space, which is... We're obviously a long, long ways from there, um, but that's, you know, that's one of the best ways we're going to be able to address this. We do have some limitations, of course, just like every single study in this area, we have a small number of astronauts. Um, I will say we're doing a follow-up study to this where we're going to add about 20-something more astronauts, so we're going to have a fairly large, large cohort in the 30s to low 40s of astronauts, just assessing more of the same. Um, and then we also do have a lack of data concerning potential SANS countermeasures usage amongst astronaut cohorts. So, you know, what methods or what attempts are individually each astronaut trying or not trying um, that might play more of a role with the development of SANS. So in conclusion, 
Our study, in conjunction with the growing body of evidence of abnormal blood flow dynamics with venous outflow stagnation during spaceflight, um, suggests a correlation between increased or uh, a correlation between intracranial venous congestion and SANS. We do propose that individuals with increased venous sinus compliance might actually be at an increased risk to develop this condition. But of course, you know, more study is definitely required in this area. Thanks, guys. All right, so um, I know we can definitely get to the questions. So I know those are one about the diuretics and I will get to that one shortly. All right, perfect. Yeah, so an interesting note, um, Patrick, about the chicken pox thing. So we've seen that not only chicken pox, but any kind of dormant chronic condition has the increased risk of um, reactivating in space. There is thought of immunosuppression occurring in microgravity. That's a well-known phenomenon. You can also see what we call neutrophilia, where white blood cells drop. Um, in astronauts, particularly the longer they're in space. Chicken pox, um, this virus, it never actually leaves your system. You actually get something called shingles when it reactivates later on in life. Um, and so the thought of it is, um, you know, when you get immunosuppressed or like people that get really stressed, they can increase the risk of getting shingles. Same thing can happen with astronauts. So they, a lot of them can get reactivated, which is obviously problematic. Sorry, one second. Okay, and then can you make a requirement for nearsighted astronauts and long duration flight? Yeah, that's funny. I, you know, and, and that's the thing is there's no there's no standard protocol that exists, especially amongst the commercial space flight agencies now. Um, obviously, you know, William Shatner is going up and Wally Funk, which I mean, they're titans of their own right. You know, they are they are ninety two years old, um, which is a little bit terrifying. Uh, me as a as a doctor, um, but you know it's you know they're able to satisfy their dreams and everything. So I think yeah, there needs to be more work in this as far as standardization and seeing you know how much of it is true, how much of it is people's um, inability for spaceflight, or how much of it is that people are changing for the tolerance of spaceflight. You know, and that's uh, obviously something that only time will tell. Um. How much uh, percent of an effect hypercapnia CO2 accumulation has the same amount of that? Yeah, so that hasn't been that hasn't been studied. Um, there, the the closest that we've gotten to studying that was in one of the head down studies where for the people that aren't familiar, what they do is they basically lay they lay a normal person down on a bed at uh, around like seventeen degrees head down, and they'll keep them like that for like weeks to months, um, and they had to actually repeat the study two or three times because the first or, or like the first time they didn't take into account carbon dioxide so you know those studies were kind of inaccurate um the second one they did and so they saw that not necessarily sands um but they saw that there was potential increase more so with some of the other effects the cognitive stuff and, and those kinds of things um than necessarily sands itself um but as far as the percentage of co2 change i don't think that's been studied it's just you know trying to standardize it to how it is on the international space station um and then ac to get to your last question is a diuretic medication like hydrochlorothiazide applicable to reduce the fluid buildup versus likely to precipitate possible kidney stone formation. So from my understanding, I don't think hydrochlorothiazide itself cut, promotes kidney stones, but the problem is, is that you're gonna, it's not a, it's not a generalized fluid problem, it's a localized fluid problem. So what would ultimately happen is if you, um, if you give someone hydrochlorothiazide, they're just gonna become fluid depleted. Um, and I think that could cause probably more problems with cognition and, and probably, you know other things unfortunately that's the problem is that we can't have um yeah so yeah, that's a great question too um so that's that's a problem is that hydrochlorothiazide is, is well and good but you're you're not localizing the volume that's being dropped you're only local you're only dropping the whole volume and so that's obviously a problem um what's possibly a volunteer astronaut with a hydrocephalus shunt like procedure that might resolve the intracranial fluid changes 
Yeah, so that's a that's a thought that's been kind of thrown around between me and some of my neurosurgical colleagues. The, there is something called um, an Omaya reservoir, which is a port that's implanted for um, brain cancer uh, patients um, as a means for them to get <clears throat> intracranial um, direct chemotherapy. And so this is actually something that they had studied. So they took, I don't know, I think like 17 or 18 um, people that had gotten cured of their, of their brain cancer, but they still had the Omaya reservoirs implanted and they actually assessed their, their pressures. That's the closest we've gone, but that was the parabolic flight. So as of now, we don't know exactly what's happening in space itself. That's a great idea if we could find someone that has hydrocephalus shunt, but also I think it'd be really hard to find someone who would sign off on that because we just haven't fully determined what's happening in the brain and you by having put by having a shunt put in you're allowing for a stop gap that could potentially cause i don't know herniation or a whole multitude of, of complications that we just don't know yet so i mean it's a great thought experiment but it's going to be hard to kind of get that pulled through at least now maybe once we have a little bit better idea of what's happening with um the intracranial di physics dynamics and flow dynamics so we'll have a better idea but um, yeah, good question. Any other questions, guys? Yeah. Um, thanks so much, Mark, for, for presenting. That was really um, impressive. And congratulations. Um, I, I did have yeah, two questions about um, so this concept of um, how we could accelerate um, angiogenesis um, in uh, with astronauts and and for spaceflight and and in particular the formation of the blood vessels and and in advance of that um, mm -hmm. inside the the brain where these um, fluid shift builds up. Mm -hmm. Build ups are and curious to hear your thoughts there. Yeah, so oh, that's that's that is something that people have thought too. Like, could we give something that promotes? There's a there's a particular um, chemical message called VEGF, um, vascular endothelial growth factor. People are thought, okay, like, could we give VEGF for people that have problems with this? Um, and this is actually something that they're exploring right now about uh, doing localized hypoxia i don't know or like localized ischemia i don't know if you've heard about like people are doing this they're basically putting a pressure cuff and they're making their arm ischemic and then after a period of time they'll like release the pressure because the thought is that you can increase vascularity in the brain and other parts of the body that might be affected in spaceflight the big problem is that while we do know that the heart we, we know that the heart changes in spaceflight um, and we don't know the long-term repercussions thus far of that. And the problem is that when you increase vascularity, you are ultimately putting more demand on the heart. We see this with people that get like uh, kidney transplants or when they get their kidneys you know, removed. When they get kidney transplant, there's a high risk of developing heart complications because now you're asking, now you're adding a ton more vascularity by throwing another kidney into the person. Um, and so one of the concerns that people have had is by doing, by promoting this, what is that gonna cause to the heart? And so this is, a, it's a really, you know, there's a lot of questions and that's why this space is so exciting because at least gives us the opportunity to ask these questions and kind of gives us the opportunity to, to potentially do more research, maybe like mouse models or whatever, now that we have mice in space. Um, but yeah, you know, that's one of the concerns that I have is I think vascularity might help with clearance, but it also might cause more of a venous problem if we're having more arterial blood it has to drain and if we're worried about the veins being the problem then what are we going to do with it with the drainage of that additional blood i'll have to ponder on that one thanks yeah yeah yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a it's a it's a it's really interesting yeah i would look up i would look up the um oh god what's the exact term that they use i think it's like ischemic ischemic performance enhancement or something like that it's something that they're it's something that they're definitely looking into particularly with astronauts yeah yes um there's this other 
idea here um, relates back to uh, electromagnetism and, okay. uh, and how electromagnetism relates to the brain. Um, here is, uh, uh, from one of our studies we recently published from the IAC last, uh, last year, uh, about electromagnetic fields and um, and and their relation to the brain and um, so in 2018 these scientists mapped the magnetic materials in the brain for the first time with a magnetometer and they found most of the magnetic um, material was at the lower parts of the brain and and particularly near the brain stem. Um, okay. Um, and so coming down here, we're, we're trying to figure out, you know, what is the significance of, um, these, uh, the electromagnetic regions of the brain and their potential involvement in space flight and SANS and these, um, symptoms that astronauts are ex experiencing. And so here, um, we, we noticed there's a concept of, of the cerebral spinal fluid that, that you know, significantly increased in volume. And um, you know, the ventricles, uh, they became more dilated. Yeah, that's, that's Robert's study. That's from our lab. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, and uh, so this fluid is, is more uh, magnetic, essentially. And, Interesting, okay. Um, and so it's unclear how much of an influence um, this fluid has on the buildup of the uh, intracranial pressure. But um, we'd, we'd definitely be interested in, you know, investigating this further and in particular potential countermeasures with like a pulse field um, to help magnetically um, move or shift the, the, these magnetic fluids. Um, and, um, yeah, that's pretty interesting. I mean, like, I know they do, I know they do like TMS, uh, transcranial magnetic stuff um, for mood changes, like mood, mood disorders. I, I mean, maybe the technology is applicable. Maybe the technology is there. It uh, just seems to be fleshed out. That's really cool. Um, what was that? What was the name of that paper that you were just looking? That you were just reading on? Yeah, uh, here's a name. Yeah, you can post the link. I'd like to read that. Okay. Yes. Yeah, you see, I I agree. Yeah, and that's the problem is that you know, there's nothing. There's very few things that are localized. Everything, unfortunately, is systemic at this point. And until we can find some kind of way to keep things relatively local within the body i think it's going to cause a lot more problems you know it's like one of the big things that people are talking about with the chip suit right now the chip suit is awesome um because it decreases pressure but what are the long-term implications of that right you know we can't cause just a intracranial drop in pressure are we also going to cause a cardiac drop in pressure what does that do to cardiac remodeling what does that do to blood through through the lungs like you know and because the problem is is it's non-specific you know chip suit causes a blood flow to the legs, but it doesn't specifically choose where it's drawing that blood from. So I think you're really touching on a, on a very particular point that as of now, the body is more complicated than, than 